Today we are going to discuss uh, killings of Filipino journalists, which uh, is a much uh, discussed and controversial topic in the Philippines and which has put us in the um, headlines of um, international organizations of journalists. So today we have uh, with us uh, Brian Gonzalez, a journalism major in the College of Mass Communication, who has a lot of questions about this phenomenon. Um, good evening, ma'am. Um, this month, we will be um, commemorating um, another year of impunity um, for the Ampatuan Massacre, which occurred um, November 2009. Um, many of us, um, journalist students, would be asking this. Um, how many Filipino journalists have been killed since the first People Power Revolution? According to estimates, about 150 community journalists have been killed since 1986. And um, other studies have said that since 1992, 77 journalists have been killed. What are the significant trends that can be noticed in this string of killings? Well, several. Um, one is that many of these community journalists were killed apparently for exposing corruption. Another trend is that uh, these uh, journalists were mostly in uh, print and broadcast media and only a few were in the uh, television industry. And then another trend is that um, a lot of these uh, journalists were commentators and columnists. And that uh, is not hard to explain because it is the columnists and commentators who, um, you know, uh, expose corruption, are critical, and um, express um, the views of the people you know, and the views that tend to be uh, opposed to those in power. So it is not surprising that it is these journalists who become the target of media killings. Uh, actually, um, most of us noticed that most of these killings um, happen in the countryside. Mm -hmm. um, why do most media killings target the community press in the provinces outside mm -hmm. of the capital? Well, in the provinces, you know, um, the relationship between the media and uh, public officials or the military is more personal than you know it would be in the in the metropolitan areas of course in the provinces usually the politicians the military uh, and other powers that be would know who are the writers who are the anchor persons or the commentators uh, in the radio. So it is easy for them to identify them. And uh, since, you know, they are far from the metropolitan areas, they can more easily harass them, arrest them, or even kill them. And, you know, they're bolder because uh, they uh, have more control of the power in the countryside. In the metropolitan areas, uh, there would be more a more impersonal relationship between the media and uh, you know the politicians. And also in the uh, uh, in the metropolitan areas, the journalists usually belong to media organizations that can support them and that can uh, give them some protection from these uh, abusive uh, politicians. Um, last May, um, um, we saw the assumption of a new president, of a new mm -hmm. administration. Um, and this um, president, President Rodrigo Duterte, seems to have a love-hate relationship with the media, the mainstream media and the community media. Mm -hmm. But what is your assessment on recent efforts to address um, these cases of media killings? Well, um, President Duterte uh, did make a lot of um, comments on the media 
you know, he was uh, very critical of media and he would, uh, I think he made many generalizations about the media that are problematic in a democracy because any president has to be covered by the media and the role of the media is to report what the president says and not to interpret what he says. So, you know, I mean, I think it was, it's problematic because uh, the president should allow the media to do its work. And uh, if he does not allow them to attend press conferences because he does not like what they say, then uh, everyone loses. The president loses because it's his opportunity to explain his policies and his pronouncements to the people. And uh, the media has to cover the president. So uh, they, they have to be given access to the president. No? He should not just rely on the government media to do the job because there are so many other media that have to do the reporting. And usually when you know, a president uses the government media, the public become, uh, you know, the public uh, be, tend to you know, not find that media credible. Because I think the Philippine media has not developed a stage as in, uh, you know, let's say in, uh, in UK where you have the BBC and the BBC can report on what the government is saying. And it is a very credible, uh, you know, medium, no? very credible station. But here, because our government media are struggling, so they're not independent, and therefore they would just tend to be used by the government or to be a mouthpiece of government. And we can see that, you know, it, is, it relies on sports or on other uh, activities, other beats, just to be able to be viable. So, you know, the president should not just rely on government media, but be open to all media. And uh, I think it is wrong to, ex to blame the media for supposedly causing confusion uh, by its reporting or for, for undermining the, the president. It is because the media is just reporting what the president has said. The media should not interpret. So it is, uh, I mean, it is almost ridiculous for the government spokesperson or the president spokesperson to say that the media should use their creative imagination when they report what the president said. You should not interpret what the president has said. You should state what he says and not embroider it, not embellish it. If journalists are expected to exercise creative imagination, then what we would have is fiction, not facts. So I totally uh, disagree with that, no? And of course, I am uh, disturbed by reports that the president harasses female journalists because, uh, I mean, a president should be someone, he is the leader of the country, so he should uh, emulate the qualities of a president, and I expect one of them to be to show respect for every individual, male or female. So that disturbs me. But to his credit, President Duterte has said that he will, uh, you know, he has already approved a, an FOI, no, and everyone was very happy about it, but I hate to dampen their enthusiasm because it is an executive order which has 166 exemptions. So if there are 166 exemptions based on already existing laws, can you imagine how many more laws there can be to exempt the freedom of information? So that is disturbing. It's not really a cause for rejoicing. But I was you know, trying to say that, uh, to his credit, the president has said that he will create a task force to investigate the killings of journalists. And that is uh, something that everyone should welcome. And I hope that something comes out of it because when we talk about killings of journalists, we talk about impunity. We have a culture of impunity here in the Philippines, which means that 
you know, those who are responsible for the killings of journalists are not punished. Somehow there is an inability to punish them, either because it's so difficult to prosecute anyone, it's hard to pin down the persons who are guilty, it's difficult to find evidence, and it takes a long time, you know, for, for all of these trials. Sometimes you have, uh, I mean, and you can imagine in the province, how in the provinces, how this might be even more difficult to identify who the, who the persons who are guilty are, to, for the trials to take place, and then for the guilty persons to be, uh, you know, not just uh, tried, but actually convicted. You know, it takes, it takes a long time. In the case of the journalists, uh, it, in the Ampatuan massacre, you know, there were 58 persons killed, 32 of whom were working journalists. And uh, it is said that there are uh, 200 witnesses. So can you imagine how long the trial would take? It's, that, was, that happened 2009. It's now 2016. And very little progress has been made, if at all, in the investigation and the trial of the Ampatuan massacre. The Ampatuan Massacre, actually, um, among students, we recognize that event as um, an awakening for the media industry. And at the same time, um, it made the public aware of the role of the community press in reporting on local politics. Um, but in light of these media killings, how do we illustrate the impact and significance of today's community press? Mm -hmm. You know, because of the Ampatuan Massacre, Many of the journalists who were there, and by the way, a, lo a lot of them are women, uh, many of these journalists were the journalists for community papers in Mindanao. So because they were killed, there were some newspapers that were left without community journalists. So I mean, the, the impact was very huge. But what is sad about it is that, you know, not everyone is supportive of community journalists who are killed. Because some people think that, you know, some of these were on the take, you know, they were on the payroll of the, uh, the uh, Ampatuan, so they deserve to be, or on the Mangudatatu, the one who was going to file his uh, COC. Was it, no, he was going to file a certificate of candidacy. So they said, you know, they were there because they were going to be paid. So, you know, some, some, some do not feel sympathetic toward journalists who are killed. But I think, you know, that they were there to do their job. And for that, we should support them. So that is what I find uh, sad, that, you know, support for community journalists is not that much. The, are also those who misunderstand uh, journalists. Well, I mean, not all journalists are perfect. And another thing I would like to mention is that in the provinces, you know, community journalists are not paid, some of them, or they paid very, very little, very small salaries. Some of them are given commissions when they solicit advertisements to put, enable their newspapers to survive. So right away, what do you have? One is that you have a conflict of interest because if they solicit advertisements, how can they be independent reporters? But they have to do that because they don't get salaries or they get very meager salaries. And then these journalists are also multitaskers. Aside from you know being reporters, Sometimes they also have to do all the other <laughs> tasks that are associated or that are involved in uh, preparing newspapers. So uh, they're columnists, and then <laughs> they, they probably have to, their PR, they do PR work for their newspaper, you know. So they have to do all kinds of things. They probably edit and this and that. So because of that, you know, they really are struggling uh, uh, journalists. And, 
And another thing that has to be noted is that many of them do not have formal training in journalism. So they don't always understand ethical problems like conflict of interest. They wouldn't think that, you know, well, if I get, uh, if I receive gifts or if I get the commission for soliciting advertisements, maybe they don't understand that, you know, that's unethical <laughs> and that it contradicts what they're trying to do. So uh, I think this is uh, something you have to understand. Um, uh, well, there are many workshops, seminars, efforts of media organizations like the Philippine Press Institute, the UP College of Mass Communication, uh, the um, Philippine uh, uh, Center for Investigative Journalism, the Center for Media Freedom and Responsibility, and you have uh, so many organizations that try to upgrade the level of competence, of skills, and ethical awareness of um, political of uh, provincial community journalists. But I'm trying to describe their situation, which is why you have to understand them and uh, um, be more sympathetic toward them. I see. Um, at, the UP of, at the UP College of Mass Communication, we have this course on community journalism. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's the college's attempt to promote community journalism yes. and to ignite interest in the field. Um, we tackled a lot of definitions for community journalism and just the word community alone we, we had a number of definitions but for you what is um, community journalism where if you look at the history of the press um, maybe up to the 1980s the term that was used for newspapers outside the metropolitan areas was provincial journalism to mean the rural journalism. But uh, the term is derogatory. When you say, I provincial, yeah, no, you, uh, you know, tend to label it as being uh, inferior to other kinds of presses. So the term that is now used and that is more favored is the community press. One, because the community press uh, focuses on journalism in the uh, community no in the not and and when you say community it refers more to you know the demographics of the area and then the people having common beliefs common uh, um, history and culture and probably common uh, aspirations and the community press is also local in its coverage. So this is emphasized more by the term community. And also, of course, when you say community, uh, it means that the people can identify with the media. But again, you know, this is problematic because the community press right now uh, is faced with serious problems of uh, survival. Uh, economic survival and then uh, because uh, maintaining and operating a newspaper costs a lot of money and advertisements are mostly concentrated of course in the metropolis you know? but there are some exceptions like Cebu has a very strong uh, community press because it's almost urban in its orientation but for most of the newspapers a lot of them are struggling and uh, it's very difficult for them to maintain the publication. Um, a lot of them rely on uh, legal notices rather than on commercial advertisements. And uh, they try to get, you know, to show that they are able to continue publishing, let's say, for a year, just so they can qualify to have legal notices. So it's really a struggle for them. Number two, you have uh, internet. People don't buy newspapers anymore. So the readership of the community newspapers has declined as has the circulation of so many uh, national newspapers. So those are our problems. And then third is, you know, community newspapers are also uh, owned by political elite. 
or by uh, those who can afford to run a newspaper. So again, it's not able to really be critical, investigative, as community newspaper should be. And given that um, these, these community papers have existed since the Spanish colonial period, mm -hmm. and given that um, across time the concept of community has been um, changing, um, how did the term community journalism develop through the centuries? Mm -hmm. Well, as I said, you know, up to about the 1980s, uh, the term used was the provincial press. And uh, um, what I'd like to do is to make people realize that, you know, the killings of journalists occur in the provinces because our press has a very colorful, very vibrant history of the community press. Usually when we talk about our press, we talk about uh, the revolutionary press, and we always think of uh, La Solidaridad, La Independencia, Kalayaan, you know, and uh, all those national newspapers. But we don't realize that we have a very strong and sustained tradition, you know, revolutionary tradition in our community newspapers, like the Diario Tagalog which existed in 1882, long before, or a few years before La Opinion, which according to Retana, the historian of the Spanish uh, colonial times, was the first political newspaper. Actually, we already had political newspapers even before then. Diario Tagalog, which was edited by Marcelo del Pilar, and which was um, very feisty, very nationalistic, uh, and very militant, you know. Marcelo del Pilar was a um, lawyer, he was a poet, okay, and he was also a, a propagandist. So he used that newspaper as a mouthpiece for uh, um, creating outrage in the people, in the local areas, no? uh, and for denouncing the friars and satirizing their prayers, the prayers, the prayers of the Catholic Church, Amanamin, and all of those. And he had a lot of uh, commentaries and columns, some of which he even um, wrote, was the ghostwriter for. You know, he would use names like uh, Dolores Manapa, <laughs> things like those. So he used uh, all kinds of strategies to expose the uh, abuses, of the Spanish colonial masters and also uh, poems, literary devices to uh, create outrage in the Filipinos. So that was 1882. And you know, before you can have a revolution, you have to have media. A revolution doesn't occur just like that. So you have to rouse the people, you have to inform them, you have to organize them, and you have to make them angry enough to join, you know, whatever movement it is you're trying to uh, raise su support for. So, Jarion uh, Tagalog was just one of many newspapers that were very nationalistic and very militant. There were other newspapers like Kapatid ng Bayan, Alitaptap, Columnas Voluntas, you know, many newspapers all over the archipelago that uh, expressed this revolutionary spirit. And um, I think we should think of that, we should trace that tradition. So it occurred in the um, revolution, revolutionary times, and then even during the American colonial period, there were newspapers, so many, like Nuevo Dia, you know, um, uh, La La, we had in Bohol, in uh, Iloilo, all over again, you had, a lot of newspapers. And then during the uh, World War II, we had guerrilla newspapers. So again, you had uh, many newspapers like um, uh, Matanglawin, for example, no? Liberation. Uh, again, these were the newspapers of the uh, 
the guerrilla units all over the Philippines. There were in Bicol, in uh, Pampanga, Iloilo, in Cebu, Leyte, there were many uh, newspapers, about at least 50 uh, guerrilla newspapers. And then, of course, in the martial law years, we had what was called the alternative press and the mosquito press. Now, it was called the mosquito press because these were small newspapers that were critical of Marcos. And the then information secretary, Gregorio Sandania, called them mosquitoes because even if you tried to kill some, there would be other small newspapers. So those were the newspapers, especially uh, when Ninoy Aquino was uh, assassinated. So you had uh, many newspapers like Guardian, uh, Veritas, uh, um, all kinds of newspapers also. Um, so you've mentioned earlier that um, there's this um, process, um, there's this um, history or tradition, or better, it's a better term, tradition, of the community press. And yes. it seems to me that it came from the colonial revolutionary uh, press. Then we have the, well, the, the guerrilla press, and then the mosquito press, and yes. so on and so forth. But um, these papers um, existed with mainstream media. Mm -hmm. So what is the most important um, characteristic of the community, of community journalism that distinguishes it from the mainstream media across mm -hmm. the years? Mm -hmm. Well, the local coverage, because the community press, by definition, you know, is usually based in a community, and uh, its coverage should be of that community, while the mainstream press tends to cover the, you know, have a wider coverage, and the issues that it would tackle would be those that are national or international. So the community press should focus on uh, what a group of people or, or the members of the community uh, think is important or it should make them think, you know, it should make them focus on what is important and what they can do, the initiatives they can undertake to solve their own problems. As mentioned earlier, um, you mentioned that there is this revolutionary tradition among many community papers we've had in the past, and even until today. But the term revolutionary can have several connotations. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the mainstream media would call it militant. Mm -hmm. um, for some officials of government, they would call it um, seditious or, uh, in another sense, um, terroristic. Um, but how does one consider a community press in the context of the Philippines revolutionary? Well, it would be revolutionary, or the way I use the term, it is revolutionary if it opposes uh, the ruling ideology and it raises questions and it also offers the people an alternative way of uh, uh, interpreting events. So uh, I think that is what would make a newspaper uh, revolutionary, but I have to qualify that because I don't think the community press now is revolutionary. It has that revolutionary tradition, but you know this revolutionary tradition was evident in our past. But I am not sure that the community press now is revolutionary because so much of it is now, you know, owned and controlled by. Yeah, uh, as I said, the uh, political elite or by the commercial interests. So how can it be revolutionary? How can it oppose, you know, that ruling ideology? And speaking of ideology, um, given that um, we link, most of the time we link the concept of revolution to ideology, um, what role does ideology play in the community press? Well, ideology is uh, very important and somehow it's always there because when you talk of ideology you're talking of power relations especially relations between the ruling class and those who are ruled so it's very important but i think uh, you know 
a community press should inform the people and explain issues to them so well that they can participate intelligently in whatever is going on and they don't just accept things as they are but that they have an idea of how can they can organize themselves let's say how they can uh, you know improve their life how they can make contributions in their own way to uplift the lives of people to address poverty to address corruption to uh, you know undertake initiatives that that could help them solve the problems at their level so that they don't have to be forever dependent on the powers that be. Actually, ma'am, um, when a journey student enters um, the yeah. College of Mass Communication, we are taught that objectivity is a myth. Um, but in the context of the revolutionary community press, um, what are some noteworthy um, ethical dilemmas that, must, that most community papers encounter and how did they resolve these issues? Objectivity is a myth. There's no such thing, I think, as 100% objectivity. But, you know, uh, we talk about it, we teach it, because we want our students to be disciplined in the way they report, so that they don't allow their bias, whatever it is, or their own beliefs, their own ideology, to get in the way of their reporting. So they have to, to have, uh, you know, at least to report the facts, and to try to present things, you know, in a fair way. But uh, I think that, uh, you know, journalists must also help people make sense of what is going on. And that is more important, to contextualize what is going on, you know, to uh, help them understand what the problems are and to encourage them to articulate their own uh, ways of um, coming to terms with those. For example, we have, we have, you know, all of these disasters. I think people should be uh, urged to uh, speak their own views on, on this and how, how this can be addressed or poverty, corruption. I mean, all of those are such massive problems that we cannot just uh, expect uh, our leaders to, to address them. And for everything that our leaders do, we need the people's cooperation. Because, you know, if we're talking about disasters and then people continue to throw garbage or, or you know, to buy plastic, etc. <laughs> so, uh, how can we do anything? Or, you know, if we talk about yeah, people uh, not wanting to, let's say, um, help themselves by uh, leaving when they are told to evacuate. You know, we need to, to explain things to them. So, so those complex things, we somehow have to try to make the people understand. I think the role of community journalism um, has been this way of giving meaning to local issues, connecting them together, and helping the people create solutions mm -hmm. for themselves. But um, the history of the community press, when we talk about it, um, it has always been a different case. It always focuses on the political economy. It always focuses on ownership. Mm -hmm. Not much on the revolutionary tradition of yeah. these papers. So how did this tradition start? How did it develop over the years? The revolutionary tradition? Yes. Well, uh, I suppose there were, <laughs> there were uh, you know, people like Marcelo del Pilar, Jose Rizal, uh, Isabelo de los Reyes, who were organic intellectuals. I mean, they came from the people and they experienced what the people also experienced. So, because they were more articulate and they could write, they used their skills to tr try to um, educate the people and rouse them, <laughs> you know, so that they would be nationalistic. It's very difficult because I think, uh, you know, there are so many other factors that you have to talk of. Like now, you know, you talk of 
cultural imperialism, talk of globalization, and uh, of course, uh, it's very difficult to train people, to teach people how to be nationalistic, but we must do that. And, you know, I feel that uh, journalism majors don't have to go into the national media. All of them belong to communities. Why don't they do something? Use their skills as uh, uh, journalists, no? And make it multimedia, you know? Why don't they run uh, the radio stations in the provinces so that, you know, instead of being uh, subjected to, being forced to listen to all kinds of inanities, they could use the radio as a means of educating people about the weather, about agriculture, health and wellness, uh, you know, um, women's issues, human rights. <laughs> There's so many things they can do and because they're uh, communication majors, they would know how to do that. So I challenge uh, graduates of the college not to go into the mainstream media. Why don't they do something in their own communities using their skills? Actually, ma'am, a lot of us during majors are afraid of joining the community press given the string of media killings that yes. have been happening lately. Um, critical reportage is met with bullets. Um, journal community journalists are harassed and sometimes even killed. But for you, um, if, in your assessment, ma'am, how, how does the establishment and those in power respond to critical reportage of the community press? Well, right now, I, I don't think uh, they're very open to, you know, criticism. And I think that's not healthy for a democracy. I think you should encourage people to express their views and, uh, you know, we are in a democracy, so that means that uh, we allow people to express themselves and we respect human rights. So people have to keep on struggling and protecting what they think uh, should be the case or what, what, what are necessary for a democracy. So I would say that, you know, journalism is a dangerous, maybe, you know, right now but a necessary profession. If we don't have a democracy, if we don't have um, a democratic press, then we don't have a democracy. Um, you've meant, you've, we've talked a lot yeah. about this, um, about how the public has been um, um, lacking in appreciation for the community press, and actually we've mentioned it earlier. In your opinion, what are the manif manifestations of this um, lack of appreciation on the part of the public when it comes to the community press? Well, for example, you know, our short memory. We don't remember the Ampatuan massacre. We don't remember martial law and uh, all the victims of martial law and, you know, some people wonder why there are a lot of people who are outraged by the prospect that the former dictator would be buried in the libingan ng mga bayani. You know, and I, sometimes I look at the Facebook, then I see comments like, move on, forgive and forget, you know, and uh, the law allows it. What is legal is not always moral. And, you know, for this to happen would be uh, so insensitive to all the victims of martial law. And it would, you know, it would, it would be a mockery of our democracy because uh, the, best, the best minds, so many young people, Students, artists, journalists uh, were killed during the martial law years. So what would be the message of uh, burying a dictator there? That it's all right for you to do that? 
because you can be forgiven. You know, I, I don't know. It would, for me, it would send a very bad message. Um, regarding that, um, since we have already established that a manifestation of this um, lack of appreciation is the public forgetting about yeah. some of the darkest yeah. periods of our history. But for you, what can be done to reinvigorate the public's appreciation for the community press and as well as um, interest, um, still interest among us youth, um, young journalists, young um, journalism students mm -hmm. to participate, to join the community press? You know, there's no excuse for the youth not to know about martial law because if, even if they were not born at that time, there are uh, victims of martial law who still who are still alive. So they should talk to them, they should watch videos, you know, they should try to ask their parents what it was like during the martial law years. So maybe there's also a failing on the part of, uh, the, of education, of the parents, of, you know, those who lived during those times to impart to the youth what it was all about. Because the youth have so many misconceptions, they think, they think during the martial law years, you know, there was order, there was discipline, uh, that if there was anything happening here in the other parts of the world, you know, there was also chaos, things like those, or even that, you know, there were so many buildings built at that time, etc. So it shows a, a lack of understanding of what the martial law years was all about. So what is my answer? Well, journalism majors especially should read you know you have internet you have so many, you have no excuse not to get information so i think you should uh, exert every effort to understand the past because how can you be journalists if you don't know what martial law was all about or if you think you know it was a good time for the philippines so you know <laughs> then how can you really be a good journalist um, but what is the role of the community press in this uh, effort to yeah. recollect our collective memory ah, of okay. the past? Well, the community press should uh, uh, improve its reportage. Because one problem with the community press is that, you know, there's not, as I said, uh, some, some news, some community papers just resort to cut and paste. Because the journalists uh, don't have enough training, you know, or they don't, maybe they don't read enough, maybe they're always on the run. If they're soliciting advertisements, what time do they have to read, to reflect, to interview, you know, so that whatever they write has context and so that they can do a good job of reporting. So that means uh, we have to have better community journalists and keep on upgrading their skills and giving them opportunities to, to uh, you know, be exposed to, let's say, conferences here or abroad. I think there are many competitions now for journalists and several community journalists have won awards in the Jaime Ongpin Investigative Awards. They have been sent abroad. So, you know, there are examples of journalists who are successful, but we have to increase their tribe. And of course, people have to read newspapers because reading is not a favorite activity anymore, I think, among the youth. Too much social media. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Actually, ma'am, um, I think that burden falls on us yeah. to do some research, to improve, um, especially among us journalism majors, to improve our reportage and to consider joining the community press. Actually, this um, talk actually yeah. um, helped me a lot in understanding the tradition, the revolutionary tradition of the community press. And I was actually inspired um, by this talk. Um, I've been planning to join the community press and this um, gave me that extra push to pursue that. So thank you, ma'am, for this um, discussion. Uh, and thank you for EIDR. For